Welcome, everybody, to the uh, start of our Summer Sizzlers uh, series. Uh, we're going to get started in a couple minutes. We've got a few more people if they're getting into the uh, webinar, and then Irene will um, kick off the uh, presentation for this evening. All right, I think we've got everybody here. I think we'll get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the 2021 season of our Summer Sizzlers. We're so glad that everyone could join us here. Uh, my name is Irene Allender. I am the Membership and Programming Coordinator at Preservation Dallas. Um, we have a great setup um, starting tonight. Um, and I hope that you can join us for our future um, sessions. Next week, we're going to have When Art Needs Some TLC. Um, Nikki Emery, who some of you know as a past Preservation Dallas um, board president, will talk about the, her conservation efforts with the city of Dallas's public art program and taking care of art throughout the city and maintaining it over the years. Um, and then we have some really great other ones. I hope you guys can come to the other ones. If you haven't signed up for the whole series, you can join each session. Um, just go to our website and there'll be more information about them. So tonight we have Patsy pittman White, and she's gonna be talking about Dionoso Rodriguez and his Trabajo Rustico. Um, Patsy is an author, an artist, a former public school teacher and a college lecturer. She earned her master's degree in art from Goddard College. She served as the chair of the San Antonio Missions National Historic Park Commission and has researched and written the nominations for 10 Texas historic markers. She was honored as a Texas Hero of Historic Preservation by the San Antonio Conservation Society and was commended by the community of Goliad for documentation of the city and the county's history. Her first book, Capturing Nature, the Cement Sculpture of Dinoso Rodriguez is in its second printing and a new book, Artisans of Trabajo Rustico, the, le the legacy of Dion Dionisio Rodriguez um, will be available this fall. And I believe you can purchase it on Amazon. Is that correct, Patsy? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, so if anybody has any questions throughout the thing, you can go down to the chat and put some questions, I'm sorry, in the Q&A, put some questions in there and we will um, ask Patsy. And then as well as the end, if you have any questions at the end, um, you can definitely ask some questions. So Patsy, I leave it up to you. Well, hello. Dallas Preservation. I'm so happy to hear of your goals. They're 
very similar to the San Antonio Conservation Society goals. And they have been particularly helpful through the years in trying to preserve and let people know that Denise Hill Rodriguez was a real person who influenced many others. Um, I thought maybe I should tell you how I got interested. It's a very interesting story. Uh, I do write national registers and markers. And I was doing a research project one hot July day in my house. And all of a sudden I started beginning thinking about the Denisio Rodriguez work that I was familiar with in San Antonio and realizing that no one had really given him credit for what he had done. So I called a friend, Mariah Pfeiffer, who writes National Registers, is a book author as well, and said, come with me, let's go take pictures. So we asked our San Antonio Conservation Society for um, a help in financing the photography we were doing, and they granted it to us. And uh, we began to really do what we could. Mariah even ended up in Washington, D.C. and Birmingham. And uh, my daughter and I went to Michigan, not Michigan, excuse me, Memphis and Little Rock. So we, we really had a wonderful time. And I, I think what gets me in historical research is the thrill of the chase. It's not original with me, that's for another professor that I know, but the thrill of the chase and of course, then finding what you're looking for is so exciting. And with me today, helping with this, my editor, Helen Skeldon of San Antonio. And we were talking about every time I would find out something new and exciting, she'd get a phone call. And then we had to start to work. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, Denisio Rodriguez arrived in San Antonio in 1924. And um, I'm, you're seeing a picture of him here in the cemetery in Cedar Hill outside of Washington in Suitland, Maryland. And um, this is an interesting picture because he has on two-tone shoes and pretty nicely dressed. According to his niece who traveled with him, Manuela Phil, he uh, would arrive at his side and put on an old pair of pants over his clothes and change his shoes because as you know, working with cement's a pretty messy product <laughs> project. But uh, he was a dandy and we have other pictures of him in suits and hats and he was, a, he was quite a dresser. We know very little about his personal wife, life, whether he had one, two or three wives, we're really not sure, we have no records, but um, he did wonderful work. And we know a lot about his work and some of the people that he worked with. He brought his skill, which we call trabajo rústico, which means rustic work in Spanish, or faubois, which is French for fake wood, with him from Mexico. On his way to San Antonio from Mexico, from Mexico City, he worked a while in a man in Monterey. Mexico for a man named Carlos Cortez. He's a father of Maximo Cortez, who you'll soon hear more about. Where um, Carlos made ornamental cast stone for a cemetery. Denicio worked with Carlos for a short time and Carlos told him to go to Laredo where his son Maximo was working on a school. Denicio traveled on from Monterey to Laredo worked with Maximo a while, and then came on to San Antonio, where he influenced many others through the years and up to contemporary times. San Antonio has the greatest concentration of the works of any city in the United States, where it has been augmented by early artisans, including Maximo Cortez, Sam Murray, and contemporary ones, including Maximo's son, Carlos named for his grandfather. Denisio worked in eight states and many of these projects are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Trabajo Rústico is characterized by the imitation of textures and shapes in nature, trees and rocks and reinforced concrete. What you do is we will describe later, you work with a framework 
of rebar, apply wire, hardware cloth, then cement, and finally begin to sculpt the cement outer texture. We have the names of Wilkinson in England and Lambeau in France, uh, who were associated with some of the first uses of steel to reinforce cement, uses of steel to reinforce cement. Lambeau built a boat and it actually floated, if you can imagine. The museum in France, who has his works, loaned us a picture, which will be in the new book. The name of the Frenchman, Joseph Monnier, is very well known. In 1849, Monnier was a gardener and he created planting tubs reinforced with steel wire for his orange trees in the orangery in the Tuileries Garden in Paris. I imagine that he needed new pots because his other pots were probably uh, quite heavy. And as we all know, what we call the hernia hour in Texas, when you have to bring your plants in so they don't freeze, he had the same problem with Paris. He patented his invention in 1867 and exhibited in the Paris exhibition in the same year and promoted the use of reinforced concrete for railway ties, pipes, floors, arches, and bridges. Uh, he's credited with this 40 foot long faux bois bridge in Chateau Chazelet in 1875, probably the first reinforced concrete bridge in the world. It's still standing, but I think it's in very fragile condition. And this structure at the Chateau de Gauzelet, along with many other projects, Fogra artisans in France, known as Rocaillet, were very prolific, prolific during the mid 1800s until the 1920s. Much of their work is still visible, including this stairway at Giverny in a garden with a thousand rose bushes. This branch railing on a faux bois facade of an outbuilding behind Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Uh, I'm not sure of its condition because this was taken before the devastating fire. And a hat on a tree stump in Mar Marseille, Marseille. And this hollow tree and stairway in Chaumont d'Oire from France. The technique spread from throughout Europe in Asia, South and Central America, and eventually the US. And there are examples found in uh, Spain, where Gaudi, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work, his large cement work throughout Spain. He designed this winding stairway and commissioned for the gardens of a textile factory in La Pobla de Lillet in 1910. You can see the banisters outside of Istanbul, where there are bridges and gardens of Yidlitz Palace. I have to digress a minute from my script and tell you that I found this picture in a travel magazine belonging to my son-in-law and I could not find a way to connect with the photographer to ask for permission. I had a friend traveling to Istanbul and I asked him if he would mind taking a picture for me. He said, absolutely not. And he became so enamored. He was on a cruise. That finally ended up in France. He, he started taking pictures in France for me. So I've had a lot of help, a lot of help. I've bought pictures, I've borrowed pictures. I've interviewed hundreds of people and I've had partners. If me, my first partner was the photographer, Bob Parvin, who was a professional who'd done many, many books, not on this subject, but cookbooks, et cetera. And then my second partner, Kent Rush, is a Professor Emeritus now at UTSA, who's been taking pictures of Faubois, Travago Rustico for 40 years and call me and ask me if I would like to write the text and he do the photographs. We took a lot of pictures and we traveled a lot of miles in a hot summer, in the cold winter. Um, the interesting thing is the Asian influence no one knows how it got there, but this is in Japan. 
and Honshu, Japan, and this fence where the work is known as Jiboku. Uh, I have a friend whose husband was stationed in Japan and she was with him. She was lucky enough to find the artisan and he gave her lessons in the process, which made it possible for her to loan these pictures of her, the work she had found. Then in Hong Kong in the bird market where we visited once, <laughs> the birds had had a bath and they're drying off. And then a Foba banyan tree on Lantau Island where the giant Buddha is. If you've not had that excursion outside of Hong Kong, that's one you'll never forget. And a toadstool in the botanical garden in Hong Kong. And then we skip over to Buenos Aires, which is another long trip. It's unbelievable structure it was called the Grot de Constitucion. It was built in 1885, was demolished in 1914 by a park commissioner who didn't like it. Faubois, as it was called in Argentina, was very popular because there were many French people who moved to Argentina. And it fell out of favor, but a few examples of genre remain in Buenos Aires, some in the zoo. An Argentinian architect, Daniel Chevelson, who loaned us this photograph, recently published his book, El Arbo de Cement, The Tree of Cement, about most of the demolished and some of the newer work that's still standing in Argentina as a result of the French influence. Then we move on to Mexico, where this work is in the Enrique Estrada Park in Zacatecas and at Parque Mexico in the La Contesa district of Mexico City. In the, un, in the 1920s, there were, uh, I'm sure many unknown artisans created the fountain and 100 of these palapa structures throughout the park. They're so similar to the work of Denicio Rodriguez, the texture is almost exactly his, but I did extensive research, even contacting the Museum of Anthropology and the staff there it was exhausting the American embassy no one could tell me who did this work but I have a pretty much a feeling that it was either Denicio or someone who was very familiar who had worked with him uh, notice the snake detail because it does reappear in some of his work in San Antonio uh, Denicio was born in Toluca, outside of Mexico City in 1891. In the early 20s, worked in Mexico City with two concrete engineers who each wrote him letters of recommendation, which I was given by his niece who traveled with him. Um, the one that we think was the most influential was probably Robles Hill, spelled G-I-L, Learn Trabas of Rustico, maybe in Spain or Europe. And then he taught Rodriguez. We're not sure, you never are, but at least we have the letters recommending him as a good artisan because at that time he was on his way to the States. And Chapultepec is credited to him with everything that looks like rock. It's called the Lagos de Chapultepec at Chapultepec Palace in Mexico City. And it probably attracted the attention of a Mexico City surgeon who had a clinic in a very famous hospital in Mexico City, Dr. Aureliano Urrutia. Unfortunately, Dr. Urrutia was on the wrong political side and he was shipped out of Mexico by US forces and sent to San Antonio. Well, he ended up in San Antonio. Um, Denicio's first job in San Antonio was making sculpture work in Miraflores, a private garden built by Dr. Ruger to entertain his family and friends. He even had a huge AIA convention in San Antonio with a lovely park in the garden. 
Uh, Dorothy Ruthie was a very interesting fellow who wore a black cape and he would walk around his garden picking the different herbs he had planted to use for cooking. Uh, he became very famous in the United States separating of, of Siamese twins and he was a well-known surgeon and received many honors. Rit wrote his, his story in two books. One of them is strictly about his garden. The other one is the whole story of his life. We, one of these uh, projects that Denisio did was that entry gate that you just saw uh, on to opening onto the busy street called Hildebrand. Through Dr. Ruthia, Denisio received work for the Park Department. At this point, I'll add, he never had anyone publicizing his work. He didn't have an agent. It was only by word of mouth recommendation that he received all of this work during his lifetime. One day, he saw Maximo Cortez on the right, who, with whom he had worked in Laredo, Texas, who was visiting in San Antonio. In this street photograph, uh, Denisio's on the left. He was a slightly built little man. And, and Denisio told Maximo there was plenty of work, so he should come to work with him. Maximo moved to San Antonio, brought his family, and began a partnership for a few years. It, um, the trolley stop in Brackenridge Park is one of their first projects, and I think they had many helpers, although Denisio's name is written on it in two places. And then we had the trolley stop, where they did a partnership with probably other workers. And it looked like this when it was first built. And then it had endured the years, then moved from the center of Broadway when they were decided to widen the street. And it's still used by hundreds of commuters every day. And the seats are polished shiny from so many people waiting for the bus. Um, Mr. Bamberger from the Alamo Cement Company gave this bus stop to Alamo Heights, the suburb of San Antonio. And he put a little plaque inside, but he forgot to mention Denisio Rodriguez's name, but we found out, finally. <laughs> um, he uh, soon was working for Mr. Bamberger on his projects. Mr. Bamberger's office of the Alamo Portland Cement is still standing, although it's a cafe now. And the 125-foot-long uh, faux fence around the office has at least 20 different kinds of wood textures. We've had arborist who could identify them. And when you see this detail, you'll understand how very realistic it is. Um, this is one of the photographs from the first book that I wrote in 2008. And then we have a palapa on the same property, which had a lovely little fountain in the middle with maidenhair fern and goldfish. It still is there, but it's not in the kind of condition that you would hope. An interesting thing I discovered while I was visiting and taking pictures with my photographer was there's a white film on much of the structure. It's the cement dust from the, the quarry and the factory, the plant. Uh, the quarry is adjacent here and that has become a shopping center and a golf course. And the big part of the hole where they were taking out the limestone is a lake. And if you haven't been to San Antonio lately, you need to come and see the quarry. It's not exactly like the shopping centers in Dallas, but it's very unique. His, um, Denisio's reputation spread and other clients have uh, really hired it throughout Texas and all the other states. Uh, one man was a sea captain in Port Arthur named Ambrose Eddingson, uh, he wanted to develop what he called the garden spot of Texas, and he built an apartment complex on the seawall at Port Arthur. 
and he hired his nephew, who was a sea captain as well, to bring 5,000 conch shells from the Cayman Islands, and Denisio and his helpers built this fence and other objects for the project. It's very interesting to know that on about 10 years ago, there was an accident and a car hit the fence and I was so upset and called the owner, a nice lady who said, oh, don't worry, honey. We've got lots of shells put up in the garage. We'll get it fixed. I guess they had a lot of them left over. He also, in that same project, did a, a little sound cave which if you remember when you hold up a conch shell and hear the sea, he built a whole little house of conch shell and you really could hear the sea sitting in it. Um, Denisio did projects in Arkansas. A businessman in Little Rock, Mr. Couch, commissioned him to work on his summer home where he built this fence with the little owl it was presumed that Denisio was very serious, but there are evidence such as Al, which indicate he had a sense of whimsy, which occasionally pops up in a project. Uh, the initials on the fence, by the way, were the family members that were in Mr. Couch's summer home. Also in Arkansas, in North Little Rock real estate developer, Justin Matthews, built parks for his projects and Rodriguez worked for him, building what Rodriguez considered his best work, including a series of bridges and sculptural pieces at Pew Memorial Park. Mr. Matthews built a replica of an old mill and then asked Denisio to decorate it, the details, the windows, the facades, and things on the exterior and the stairs inside, and then the garden. And these bridges are fantastic. If you've never been to North Little Rock and had never seen this, you've missed it. Try someday. They know what they have and they take very good care of it. Uh, Clovis Hines of Memphis, a businessman, I had been to California, who is a big traveler. And he went to Forest Lawn Cemetery in Los Angeles with his decorative sculpture. He was very impressed. And he came home and engaged Rodriguez to build biblical themed pieces in a cemetery, which he named Memorial Park Cemetery. He wanted people to come for more than just the cemetery. He wanted them to see something. He also built a cave lined with crystals from a cave in Arkansas. And it has the scenes of the life of Christ. You walk in this cave and there are many scenes and these sparkling crystals reflecting the holes in the roof make it spectacular. This is Abraham's tomb, they called it. This is in the building process and you see our Denisio in his dandy dress, tie, hat, everything. And um, this is um, still there, still in good condition because they've taken good care of the park, of the, of the uh, cemetery. He would um, repeat subjects, um, but in different forms. So this is his fallen tree sculpture. It is in Miraflores, the private park of Dr. Ruggia in San Antonio. And they're all inspired by the real thing. And then he did his hollow tree houses like the one he built for himself in San Antonio on Guadalupe Street. It had windows and door, a little cot. And um, he used it when he came home to visit to San Antonio because he had diabetes, which was discovered late in his life and he had needed medical attention. And so he would come to San Antonio and stay in his little house. And he wouldn't let the neighborhood girls in, but the boys went. And he would bear a bury pennies in the floor so the children would have something to do when they came to see him. At Lakewood Park in North Little Rock, there's a bird house on this hollow tree that you can see at the top, which is another indication of his whimsy. 
And here's another image of the Abrams Oak in Memorial Park. And then he did these palafa roof structures where the cement was modeled to look like uh, thatch on the roof. Very realistic. Uh, this reminds you of the structures that you see on the beaches in Mexico, uh, like sunshades. His uh, root seats are very interesting on this one. And this <clears throat> uh, Alamo cement had a, a very nice one over a fish pond. It, and uh, this was in Breckenridge Park near the zoo. It had an accident several years ago. A tree fell on it, and the city fathers asked Carlos Cortez to restore it. He came with large trailers and trucks, and they moved it to his studio down on the south side of San Antonio in the King William District. It's been there a couple of years. While he was working on it, he discovered there was a whole nother bench underneath, which looks like the bench that was originally in Alamo Plaza. <clears throat> Carlos Cortez in his studio it was willing to show us a demonstration of what happens when you start a piece. First, you take your rebar and you bend it in the shape that you want. Early, the artisans used wire to put it together. Now there's some of them are welding it. It's not an easy job to bend the rebar. It takes a lot of strength. After the rebar is bent, then they apply hardware cloth, this metal over the top, which is used the base for putting on the cement. You push the cement with a lot of pressure through the holes in the hardware cloth and you begin building up the structure on the outside. The last coat is done with pure Portland cement most of the time as Denisio used because it becomes, it can be malleable and you can take the homemade tools of forks and knives and sticks and anything else you need to create the texture. We're looking now at Carlos Cortez doing the last two steps, and that is to apply the dyes or chemicals. Uh, the chemicals were a great uh, thing that Denisio had is his own secret. He bought them from a supplier and one of the chemists at the Alamo Cement Company, boiled them in hot water, and applied them while the piece was just still slightly damp. And sometimes after it dried and soaked in, they would apply a big rush of water with the hose. Uh, Carlos is putting on the color. And then after that, uh, many of the artisans use a wax coating. At this time is a good time to tell you that many of the pieces don't hold up if they break. The air gets into the iron rebar and causes it to rust and things begin to expand. There are people like Carlos Cortez who can do the restoration. Rene Romero is another local artisan and a man who works for the Kaler Foundation um, all over the United States, Shane Winter of Houston. We know that even though Denisio died in 1955, he made this, excuse me, I'm off on the dates and off on my people. <laughs> this is the last, one of the last things that Maximo Cortez helped his son Carlos to build at the Witte Museum in San Antonio. Um, it's called the AGB Science Tree House. And it was engineered to hold a whole bus load of school children who would be visiting the museum. It's still very popular and it's connected to the science tree, the science building with all sorts of experiments for kids to do on hand.
But Denise Joe, with we know, had other people working for him. And this is the Briones house in Austin. Gerardo Briones had worked with Denise Joe in several places. He built this house and himself over a period of years and did these inside decoration, incised polychrome decorations for the outside and did some structural on the outside and some interior details, which um, we were allowed to see and photograph, but I don't have the photographs with me today. When Irene invited me to share the story of Denisio with you all, I revisited my research and found two examples in Dallas. One of them is this bridge, which I had a photograph from a friend who lives in Dallas, said that her father-in-law had had this done by a man probably from San Antonio. So it's anybody's guess who he was, but the bridge is still standing according to the owner. And then in my papers, I found this postcard of the Laurel Land Memorial Park Cemetery, which is still existing, and had this picture of this botanical rock garden, which immediately reminded me of the rocks at Chapultepec in Mexico. Uh, I'm, I, these probably are real rocks, but it was a thought that went through my head because Denisio was in Dallas in 1934 and 1944. So it's possible we never had really found anything that he had done. About um, 20 years ago, my husband and I visited the cemetery because I was looking for his work and we found a chair sculpture with a bare tree behind it. Unfortunately, it was pouring down rain that day and the whole sculpture was covered with ivy. When I was knew I was going to talk with you all, I tried to contact the cemetery and finally found out that they didn't know anything about it. They didn't know what year, but someone, it must have realized that the ivy covering was hiding something that they needed to show. I don't think this is Denisio's work, but it's very possible that someone was with him who did it, or maybe that he was just not doing as detailed as possible. But this is a project for one of you all, if you're interested, maybe you can find out. I'll warn you first, the cemetery doesn't know anything, but there must be something in a newspaper somewhere about this piece. Um, Denisio traveled around the country, and I told you probably maybe earlier, I can't remember, that he bought a new car every year because he didn't know anything about cars. And he took friends or other workers with him and they hired workers in the different towns where he worked. But his interest in cars resulted from his lack of knowledge about them. Um, there are thousands of images of his work. And I hope you've enjoyed the preview, which shows that the tradition of Trabajo Rustico is alive and well. And I'm gonna say hats off to the French who started it all. And I enjoyed talking to you and sharing with you my interest, which is still going on. Somebody told me about something new the other day that I need to go see. Uh, I welcome your questions. If anybody would like to talk about it, I'd be happy to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll answer you by mail. Irene, is there anyone who wants to say anything? So I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, someone wanted to know where the bridge was that you talked about in Dallas. Do you know where, where it was located? It's in a private home and um, I, the, the owner must remain anonymous, I promised her, but um, I imagine it's somebody you know. <laughs> I can't tell you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. And then I have one other question. Someone said, isn't there a painting of Dr. Eurecia's garden and Dionysio's work? Do you know of a painting? Uh, can you describe it more fully? 
Um, they don't say. Well, if she can tell you, you can tell me, and then I can answer you if I know it. And if I don't, I'll look it up. <laughs> By the way, uh, having done this research could not have happened in several different ways. First of all, I have to give credit to my editor who was so enthusiastic, helped me every step of the way and helped me find things. But also the internet was the most unbelievable resource. There wasn't anything really written except a lovely book by Michelle Racine, who is a Frenchman and it's in France, in French and you can look it up on the internet. And um, then there's a book about Monnier in French written by the people who live in the village where Monnier grew up. And it's also in French, but uh, there really wasn't anything. So what I found were pictures of sites that I could use and branched out from there and um, then branched out to artisans across the country and have found so many. And by the way, there's several women who are still working in the in the process. And it's very interesting because the work is so hard and you have to wear those gloves because it is so sticky and it really can damage your hands. Anybody else? That might be all of our questions. Well, it's been fun and I'm really proud of you all for your work you do in Dallas. It's really similar to our Conservation Society and they work hard and they've been very successful as I'm sure you have. And thank you for giving me a chance to share what I know with you. Oh, well, and I guess- you, Patsy. Yeah, we really appreciate it. I also wanna thank Nick Meldy and the San Antonio Office of Architects for hosting you tonight. We really appreciate them do stepping up and helping us out with that. So, all right, everyone. Well, that is tonight's session. Um, we'll see you next Tuesday um, with Nikki Emery um, talking about conservation. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.